This special budget workshop of the Judson Board of Trustees is hereby called to order at 5.03 p.m. I am very pleased that you have taken time to join us this evening, this afternoon, in compliance with the State Government Code on open meetings. Today's agenda has been appropriately posted. We have established a quorum, and I will call roll. We'll start with Ms. Rodriguez. Jennifer Rodriguez, present. Ms. Uh, Kenoyer. Suzanne Kenoyer, present. Ms. King. I just Chitani have King, point. present. And I'm Renee Pichelle, present. And to my immediate left is our superintendent of schools, Dr. Jeanette Ball. Thank you for joining us. All right, Dr. Ball, you can take it from here. Yes. So today we have another one of our budget workshops. Uh, Mr. Atkins has been working on it, and each one of you should have a copy. Uh, and do we have any extras, Bill? Oh. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I just would like to add for the record that we do have a candidate that has uh, filed for the District 4 seat. Miss Yvette Livingston is here. We'd like to welcome you to our budget workshop this evening. Welcome. I'd also like to welcome my senior staff members. Dr. Fields, thank you for being here. Ms. Davis, thank you for being here. Mr. Adkins, we could not do this without you. So thank you very much uh, for being here. Appreciate the team always working together. Mr. Adkins, we're going to go ahead and just turn it over to you. Right. Madam President, board, Dr. Ball, this is our second budget workshop. Um, we've got a little bit of additional information today, but it's still early in the, the budget planning process. A lot of what we've been doing is working on the equity pay scales, uh, we'd like to try and bring pay scales to you in April for approval. Uh, so that's where we've been putting a lot of our work. Okay. okay. So uh, we will, again, as we always do, we'll start with our current budget and see where we are. Then we'll look at our budget assumptions. We'll look at revenue. Uh, and there's a little uh, interesting information there. Uh, well, the raise in equity cost, we've pretty much gone over those, me and Marco. <clears throat> we'll look at some things at the pay scale that we're looking at. We'll talk a little bit about staffing and then we'll have questions and of course, ask questions anytime you'd like. So this is our general fund budget and this is our year to date. We're about two thirds through the fiscal year. So we should be in the 60% range. Now revenue, it comes in at different times. Like we've got most of our tax revenue in. We probably have another good month and that's it. <clears throat> the state revenue, most of it's not gonna come in until uh, June, July, and August. And the federal revenue should be here in April. So we're sitting at about 66%, which is about right. Uh, looking at our expenditures, most of them are in the 60s. Uh, which is where they should be. Um, the debt, as you see, 99%. We've made all our debt payments for this year. Uh, and then the capital expenditures, a lot of those are made up front because they're equipment that's needed. And again, the $851, $1,000 is the settlement money that has to be used on Copperfield. Child nutrition. We knew this was going to be an issue coming into the budget year. Um, you can see our revenues are drastically down. We were feeding a lot less students. Um, so we're at about 28% of total revenues. Uh, the reimbursements do run a month behind. So um, we'll see a little bit at the end of the year. Um, our expenditures, we've been really working hard. I know we have looked at every staff position and we have not hired a lot of staff positions. Um, and so they've done a really great job of trying to maintain that. But um, we're gonna right now look at about a $2.6 million deficit. Uh, and that program can't run a deficit. So general fund will have to pick up whatever deficit they have at the end of the year. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk to me about um, the state revenue and why it's so much different than what we budgeted? 
that just really sticks out? The, the state revenue, typically it's that, but this year because of the, um, the low feeding amounts, the state sent, uh, they, they put like a little multiplier on their little amount they send us, so we got a little extra this year. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Debt service, again, um, we have about another month. We should be at a, about 100% revenue. Uh, we're almost there now, and uh, we've made all our debt payments. Uh, and of course, the inflows and outflows is just how we record the uh, refunding of the bonds. So the budget assumptions really haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, still, we're budgeting on a 1% enrollment drop. Um, this is probably the scariest assumption I'm making based upon the number of charter schools that I'm seeing pop up. Uh, the 5% increase in the value I think is a conservative uh, assumption. 98% tax collections, we should be there. Um, uh, total tax rate of the same that we have this year, 1.2749. We're, we're hoping the state will provide some funding for virtual schools. There is a bill filed, but it's to provide it through the Texas Virtual School Network. Uh, and so that's a, a program that's already there. Uh, and if that passes, that may be something that we could access. Again, um, yes, ma'am. So on the, I, I think it's wise to do, to budget for a 1% enrollment drop, but I'm curious as to um, with, I know a lot of parents like held their kids out of pre-K and kinder this year, um, just didn't even send them or do remote or anything like that. Are we expecting a little bump in say first grade because of that? Or because once they reach that age, you can't keep them out of school. Right. Um, I don't know, Ceci, if you want to talk to anything about enrollment? <coughs> Thank you, Ceci. Okay, additional revenue, again, um, 100 students to us is about $676,000. Um, and so the more students we can put in seats, the better off we are. We currently access five of the seven tier two pennies. Some people recommend them as golden pennies. Um, under current conditions, we would need a tax ratification election to access those additional pennies. But there is an exception when a disaster is called. The year after a disaster is called for a tornado, hurricane, fire, something like that, anything other than a drought, you can access those pennies for one year and then you have to have an election. Well, I thought I had figured it out, but I think the state figured it out first because they've already filed three bills that add pandemic and epidemic over to the drought side. So I think that's going to go away. But that would have brought us $8 million. But it's still there now, so I'm going to kind of show you side by side. But I'm really going to concentrate on the budget that is without the three pennies. So there's kind of what revenue would look like on the left-hand side without the pennies and on the right-hand side with the pennies. And you can see the difference is $8.4 million. And we would keep the tax rate the same by adjusting the debt service tax rate. So maybe it won't pass. Um, I think the state would actually go broke because most districts are probably going to jump on it if they don't. So if we look at our estimated revenue, $206 million, our current payroll of 170, operational budget of 39.5, we're at 2.8 million. That's about the same as we talked about last month. The, we've gotten really into the two and 3% raise. And last month, I presented a 2% raise. But as we started doing the equity 
on our auxiliary and clerical scales. Just giving a 2% raise and bringing those bottom scales up really started to compress the scale on the top end. There wasn't a lot of difference. So I went back and I said, well, if we give everybody in those scales a 3% raise, then that scale doesn't get compressed so much. Uh, and it, it costs about the same. So that's what I'm proposing is that for our hourly employees would be a 3% raise, all other employees would be a 2%. And that cost us about $4 million, and that's a little more than we looked at um, last time. But we actually looked at every employee and made sure they would make the minimum on that scale. Um, yes. How close would a 3% raise get our lowest paid hourly employees to like, you know, what had been proposed as a federal minimum wage of $15? Not much. 3% uh, raise for our lowest employees would be about 30 cents an hour. Oh, okay. And and that would get them to what per hour? Uh, I, I oh, have, okay, I have never a mind. Deal in Sorry. Here. Well, I'll show it to you. <laughs> so then we talked about doing the teacher pay scale, and again we went through it person by person. It's a little bit, but it's pretty close to where we talked about last time, about three million dollars, to get us some competitive with our neighboring districts, and really help our teachers, especially in that six to twenty year range where we're really below. So this is the 200 and 300 pay scale, and I think, Ms. Rodriguez, this might answer the question. On the left is our current scale, and you can see our minimum is $9 an hour at 201. What Marco and I did was we compressed 201, 202 into 203, so that the minimum pay for that would be $14 an hour a really nice increase for our employees, but it cost $4 million. Um, and you can see how the scale kind of goes on down this. We did the same thing in the clerical, and we put it in 303, and this one actually had two good things to it because we have aides on campuses, and sometimes they're paid different levels, and um, it, it limits the principal on being able to use them where they're needed. This would put all our aides on one scale. So the principal would have the flexibility of saying, to use that aid wherever, the aid is wherever the aid is needed. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the things we tried to do. So yes, so again, a, a really nice jump. I think everybody in these scales is getting over a dollar an hour raise. Um, some of them more. Um, so when we add that in, that's about $3 million. So we're right now at a $13 million deficit. Uh, you know, last month I, we were at $10 million and I, I told you I thought I was crazy even bringing that, and now I'm bringing you a $13 million. Uh, so, but... I mean, I think there's things that we can do. Um, I, I am a little concerned about this is a recurring cost. And so one of the things we looked at was our pay calendars, and Marco kind of came up with this idea. And so we have our year-round employees, 260 and 226. And one of the things Dr. Ball has always wanted to accomplish here was to give our employees the week of July 4th off. Many districts do that. They close up the campuses, they raise the thermostats a little bit, they turn off the lights, they turn off the computers, and they try and save, and you know the employees have a week off. And uh, so we either have to pay extra to do that, or we could do something like this. So currently, we're on the left-hand side. Our 260-day employees are paid for 260 days. They have 10 paid holidays, 10 vacation days, and they work 240 days. So if we paid them for 255 days, gave them 15 
paid holidays, they would still work 240 days. They still get the raise, and um, they would be off the week of July 4th. So that means all our custodians, all our maintenance, everybody would be off July 4th. So um, we Excuse thought Excuse me, was... Mr. Atkins. Yes, ma'am. You're saying the week of July 4th and then July 4th. So you are talking about the whole week, not just the day. Uh, the whole the week. The whole week. All okay. five days, yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, yes, ma'am. No, I was just going to say, and if anybody would like for me to explain the reasoning for that a little bit more, I would be happy to do that because we, I know I, Mr. Atkins, Ms. Robinson, and, and maybe Ceci is also in another district have done this, and it really is beneficial. A lot of the research does show how people do burn out when you don't take a vacation, and people sometimes don't take a vacation because you don't want to miss anything and there's so much going on. So this really does force the shutdown. It's usually the hardest the first year because it's different, but then in different sy systems that I've worked in, people end up loving that opportunity to really not worry that you missed a meeting, not worry that you still have 100 emails piling up because other people aren't on vacation. So it really allows individuals to just rest and relax. But if there's any questions in regard to that, I'd be happy to answer those. Oh, go for um, it. So what happens to the 10 vacation days? Then you still, though you're not using all your days in the, um, during the 4th of July holiday, you still have the other days to be able to use at your discretion. So for example, you would get the 15 paid holidays for the 255, and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, you would be using four of those days in five, excuse me, five during the 4th of July holiday, and then you have the other 10 to use at your discretion. Well, and what's also not shown here is we give 12 personal days that they can use at any time throughout the year. If they're a full-time employee year-round, they get 12 days. So Thanks for clarifying that because I didn't know whether or not Ms. Eaton knew that, but full-time employees, they get 12 days every year, personal days, to use at their own discretion. Mm -hmm. And, and so, I might, uh, uh, let me just well, also say, excuse me, uh, Mr. Atkins, that Ms. Eaton has um, come to the meeting. She, she got here at uh, 513. And so the other group that we had to work with is Oh, our, Bill, excuse oh, me. There was one more question. Sorry. I'm sorry. I think I had a very similar question to Ms. Eaton, but I think I'm a little confused still. Okay. So 226 and 260, we're not talking about like central office staff or principals or something. This is like no, hourly this, employees yeah. or? The, the 226 is going to be your principals, central okay. office staff. Your 260 is going to be your maintenance custodial. Okay. Uh, um, people um and then um so paid holidays like is that like oh well president's day is a holiday on our calendar or you know like those thanksgiving it would be, it would be thanksgiving christmas okay. new year's got it those. yes ma'am okay so then um and so i think i'm confused about under the current system on 260 they have 10 paid holidays 10 paid vacation days yes ma'am they would go to 15 paid holidays where they don't get to choose those are just on the calendar as days off yes ma'am are they the ones that also have 12 personal days yes. or okay yes. okay i'm just making sure that, that there's like no flex like they're not losing no, no. all their flexibility like we're telling them when they have to take their time off no, okay they have so 12 got it personal okay days. Yes, thank you very much i appreciate it yes ma'am um this is this is different. Uh, there has been times in the past where we've closed for the whole week of of uh, Fourth of July, take a week off in July, and everything closed down. But it wasn't on a basis like this. Is this similar to what other districts do? Because I want to make sure that um, districts, we're not so far out of the norm. Right. Districts do it a little different ways. I'm sure there are districts to do it like this. Um, this really doesn't save us any money this year because the raise is already calculated on the 260. But going forward, 
it could potentially save us some money in able to give additional raises. So if I'm multiplying by 260 days, it's a little more than if I multiply by 255. So it's something that could help us moving forward. Ms. Kenoyer, we retired at the wrong time. <laughs> well, this wouldn't affected us anyway. We weren't these, <laughs> these workers. <laughs> and the, the 226 employees, which would be the professional employees that work year round and the clerical, um, they currently get 226. They get paid for 226. They have seven non work days. We would pay them for 220, and they would have 13 non work days. And that's how that would work out. And then, like I said, the result is we're closed for everybody. I've been at districts where the professionals were off, but the hourly had to work. Right. And I, I just much, much rather have everybody off so that we could at least try and make some savings out of it with our utilities and stuff. And kind of the last point is the equality versus equity. I'm sure you've seen this before. Equality kind of means we treat people the same. So if you have a thousand student school, you get the same staff as a 500 student school. Um, and for the most part, we're under the equity where we treat each other by need. Most of ours is based upon the number of students and, and that's how our formulas work. Um, we have some areas that are not. And so I think there's an equity issue that we, we should discuss. When you have a thousand student school with the same administrator staff as a 500 student school, and a thousand student school is getting it done, do we need that same administrative staff? And I know that's a tough discussion, but we have some really small schools. And so in your assumptions, are you going to be addressing those somewhat smaller schools? Well, we tried to last year, and we didn't have really good success. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we have looked at this, and we've thrown it around. And I, I just asked Dr. Ball, I said, if we're really not going to stick to it, I would really not, rather not go through the exercise and the drama. Mm -hmm. And I know there's going to be some no matter what. Because... Okay. People look at their realm, and that's what they see. Where in this area, we have to look at what's best for the entire district, and sometimes that's a much tougher decision. Right. So as we've been preparing to go into our staffing meetings um, that we will have, I would like for the board to to be very conscious of the fact about the equality versus equity. It's very difficult for people to understand that things have to change um, and find a way to do it. But we would really like to try this first before ever having to look at closing any of our smaller campuses. So when you're looking and thinking, well, what does this really mean? And we had discussed it last year. What it really means is looking at numbers, looking at the student enrollment and saying, if you don't have more than, I'm going to make up my numbers right here, okay? More than, let's say, 500 students, you're not going to have the assistant principal. Um, that's really the biggest one, is the assistant principal component, and then also the number of aides that larger campuses would get. So I definitely would love to hear questions or thoughts about it. Yes. Um, it's Miss Eaton. Yes. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you, you remember, Dr. Ball, that uh, you also brought up the idea of uh, con converting is the word I mm -hmm. could think of because that's what came to my mind when you said it. Mm -hmm. um, some of our campuses into specialty yes. campuses. Yes. And so in an effort to do that, mm -hmm. wouldn't we be moving some students from smaller campuses and kind of spreading them out to make the building, you know, the space available 
once we figure out, because I love that idea. And it's so funny, you brought it up uh, uh, over, well, sometime last year. And mm -hmm. I just started hearing um, one of our other school districts yes. talking about it. You know, oh, come to our district, this is what we're doing. And I'm like, they must know Dr. Ball. I seriously <laughs> thought about that. But, yes. um, so next, at the regular board meeting um, next week, you'll hear about two, two new programs. One of them is a, the converting, we'll use that word, yes. of ELOF into a specialty. So you'll hear that information. Then you'll also, um, you got a little glimpse of it at the last board meeting in regards to um, one of our bilingual programs also being at two different campuses. So you'll start to, you'll hear about that at the March board meeting. We're also looking at the May board meeting, bringing you information about a campus that wants to pilot truly being a year round campus to offer that opportunity for our parents. So we know that several other school districts have at least one campus in their district that, um, that offers that. And again, it goes back to what you said, is offering these special opportunities for our parents. For some that say, you know what, it's really hard for me to find daycare all summer long. So I want my child to be here you know, at this certain campus. So eventually, that having the specialties and the magnets could take care of that. So that's why I'd rather not close a campus and work our, and continue to work our programs to where we have sufficient students to have the required staff that principals would want. I, I envision it uh, ending up just like with Jessica, mm -hmm. it, you know, um, where, you know, they uh, apply, depending upon what the program is to guide them on their path. And I envision it, you know, being like full every time it's offered mm -hmm. because it's such great ideas, you know. Right. So, so that's that's our our path that we that we want to start, where we truly have specialties, um, and we are. And you'll hear about that next week. But it isn't something that we'll be able to have you right know, away. a lot of them um, right. the first year, but we'll start with three and then continue to grow every year until we have a variety of different specialties and always in a hope of boosting our enrollment. Well, I, I and, love the idea because education has drastically changed. And with the pandemic, you know, it's thrust all our children into technology. Some of them may not have been exposed to. And so with that comes the blessing of that being the first step to get them to be energized about other sub engineering and mm -hmm. uh, aircraft and mechanics and stuff. So right. I and like that. I like that. Thank you. And the other thing that that could happen is that let's say a campus starts with 250, 300 students. If the enrollment goes up and it goes up to the staffing model, we can always add. It's easier to add. So we could always add the staff that would be needed. That could also work as an incentive to make sure that we're retaining and keeping our students. So adding wouldn't be a problem if you're maximizing your enrollment and adding the numbers. But Ms. Kenora, I think you had a question. So I've worked at what was the largest elementary school in the district, Candlewood, back in the day before mm -hmm. they opened up Pichelle, um, and oh, Eloff, actually. And I've also worked at one of the smallest schools at Franz Elementary. And my concern is always for the impact on students. Mm -hmm. When you work in a small school, everybody does double duty. You're on three committees instead of one because there's three teachers on the grade level and every committee needs a grade level representative. Um, when you don't have the assistant principal and they're the ones who are in charge of testing and we know what a burden testing can be, then somebody else has to step up to do that. Um, and often it's the counselor. And so that means those students then lose the services of a counselor. So my concern is always when we look at this, if, if they're sharing a librarian, the impact on students is that they only have a librarian half time when other schools have one full time. Mm -hmm. So what is going to happen? What's the focus on the students? And that's where we should always take this back to. Mm -hmm. And so I would want to see that all of those things addressed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But Ms. Kenoy, excuse me, 
if we, okay, say we have a, one school that only has uh, 250 students, you know, as an example, and we're going to now start using that school for one of the specialty schools, we will redistribute those children into our other schools so then they'd be moving into a larger school. Yes, but we're not talking about doing that at every campus now, and we are no, talking about I, all the smaller I, I, schools I losing assistant that. principal and maybe other staffing. You know, who, who supervises at lunch if you cut back all the aides? If you don't have an ISS aide, what happens there? So, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's a lot of concerns about losing personnel at a small school because everybody at those small schools does extra work already. Right. Yeah, she's talking about the, 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 the staff, not the students. Yeah, I, I understand. But um, thank you, Ms. Kenoya. And, and Dr. Ball, the other thing I can see it doing is uh, an incentive to some of our teachers that may, maybe we have some teachers that they're engineer heavy. You know, that's <coughs> something that they, you know, they love, you know. That's incentive for them to get certifications or whatever is required to do that type of thing, just as an example. But, so it's an incentive for the employees, I see. Yes, and, and now that you mentioned that, um, next Tuesday we have some um, meetings with some people from UTSA in regards to a grant that uh, we were going to look into to be able to uh, have our teachers get a master's and it's paid for by this grant and then they could become uh, dual credit teachers because they would have the master's, like you said, in engineering or something else. <coughs> So we do, we do have a meeting with them on Tuesday for that. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So along with um, these ideas, mm -hmm. you're also going to have the, the numbers to go with. I, I, I just want to see what the cost, uh, if the, the comparison is. The savings cost? The savings cost mm -hmm. for specialty campuses converting to a different type of situation. Right, so right now the, you be bringing those numbers? the only one that we would have is ELOTS okay. um, because that's next Tuesday, next, excuse me, next Thursday. So that's the only one that we have right now. We could also do the one, Ms. Davis is doing a presentation and I will ask both of them that if there's any cost to making this at, for those two campuses to include a slide on that, if there is any cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, that was just my concern also with, you know, yeah. the same one as Ms. Knoyer's though about the burden on the staff. What would mm -hmm. that look like? So I would like yeah. to, to see more information on, on that. So let, let me make sure that I get the correct direction. Would the board like to leave staffing as it is? Or would you like for us to bring you additional information as to the changes that we could do that would those changes would mean less staff so to be fully transparent i would say yes please yes bring, to bring all the information that we would need to make an assessment on what it would look like right the possibility of what it would look like but i i, I just want to be clear that we, whether it's Bill, the entire team, mm -hmm. we are also okay mm -hmm. if the board says, you know what, Dr. Ball, it doesn't really matter what you bring. And I don't mean this in a rude way, so I don't know how to say it. <laughs> we, we, we would rather just, we, we'd rather just leave it the way it is this year. Uh, we're okay with that too. Um, and we would, we appreciate the honesty and the feedback knowing now, so we're not, Spending, and we would do whatever you would like. So my words are not coming out really good as long as the board knows that I, what I'm trying to say is that we're okay with it if you want us to leave it the way it is. We're okay with it. We truly, sincerely are. We'd rather know up front. We're, I think what I would like to see, uh -huh. because I'm very confused about what is the change you're proposing, I just need to see it on uh -huh. paper. Like, here's, here's what it is now. Here's what, what we're proposing like. mm -hmm. okay. and why. Like, I understand the why, but I don't actually understand what is the change that you're proposing. Um, and so that I, I, I have that ready. If we could send that to you tomorrow in Friday notes. That sounds perfect. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any Ms. way Eaton? we can zoom into uh, the, you said the 
staff is having a meeting on Thursday? Or no, no, we, we don't. are. We're having a board meeting on Thursday. Our, our board meeting. No, no, no. What's the meeting that she's hosting? Uh, I'm sorry. It's okay. The UTSA meeting? No, you don't want to. No, no. Okay. I, yeah. Do you mean yeah. the meeting she's going to present the program at? Yes. It's going to be at the regular board meeting. Oh, okay. Yes, yes ma'am. At our meeting. Yes, yes. ma'am. Okay. Yes. I, I didn't understand that. So yes, I'm doing now. Yes. I was just going to ask, could we zoom into it? But if we no, it, it's part of the, the meeting. Um, we're still working on, you know, I know that Ms. Davis and Ms. Robinson are working on their presentations. If they have their presentations ready tomorrow, we will post them with the board packet. But for sure, you will get uh, the presentation on Thursday. Okay. I, I'm with you now. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, Anybody else? Yeah, I just want to say that um, it's been a really hard year for our employees. And I, and I have concerns about the burnout that they're suffering. I, and I know that's a concern mm -hmm. for all of us. And we're really talking about two small schools and one middle school that's a small school, right? Um, it would also affect a high school too. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my concern is always retention of our personnel and um, because we know how much it costs us when we have to replace personnel and the effect on the students. And so that's always what I'm looking at. So I'm not up here saying no, but I would like a little bit more information so we can kind of gauge, is this really, is it worth it? Yes, that makes complete sense. So we will put it out on Friday, tomorrow. <laughs> oh, okay. So you're saying include that in the Friday notes? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So in summary, um, the first thing is I went to the legislature online today uh, just to see if there were any bills filed on increasing funding and education, and there are none. There are many bills filed uh, limiting what we can do with our tax rate. Uh, there's a bill filed to form a commission to look at the funding for special education uh, and there's a couple bills that are filed that just do minor tweaks to House Bill 3, nothing major. So I, I still think we should be limiting our hiring um, so that we can do the raise. Um, we're still at the $13 million deficit. I, I'm excited about increasing the pay scales for our teachers to be competitive and try and keep them in our district after they've been here for five years. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about being able to provide a, a much better starting salary for our lowest paid employees. We want to definitely continue that equity that we have with the Wagner feeder pattern. Um, we would like to move forward with the 226 and 260 day change and close on the week of July 4th. And with that, I'm pretty much through other than just let you know that we do have staffing at the end of March. Right. Could you go back, Oops. Bill, if you don't mind? So though you're not giving any approvals or any formal decisions, it is very important for us to get information from you um, in regards to you could say, hey, Dr. Ball, don't even want you to look at that, don't want you to consider that, or Dr. Ball, please add something to this. And I can give you some examples. The district being closed the week of 4th of July, I think it's important that we share that with staff as soon as possible so people could make that. So, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, get some, some feelings on how you feel about that. Again, explaining to people the 226 and the 260 calendar changes, people normally don't, un and, and, it's just different. It's when something is different, it takes a little bit of explanation. And sometimes, you know, they only hear certain parts. And then the way we've been doing meetings, it's all been through Zoom. So then that even poses a challenge. So we want to make sure that we start to get the word out slowly, you know, but surely. So those, I, I know, from what I understand, the board was already good with the raises and the equity. So I, I felt pretty comfortable with that. That brings, you know, the pay scales to a competitive and we'd all had agreed that in April we would bring this so our teachers wouldn't leave us. 
um, again, then starting to move uh, the other pay scales for the starting wages. But out of looking at these items, is there anything, A, that you would like to say, hey, Dr. Ball and team, go back and look at, and then, of course, B, hey, Dr. Ball, please stay away from that. I, I, um, just out of curiosity. Is your mic on? Yes, it is. Um, have you received any, because you know how things get out. Mm -hmm. Have you received any feedback from any of the teachers? Uh, they really don't know about this yet. I, I have not shared this with any of the teachers yet. If, if it's out there, it would just be because somebody shared with somebody else. But yeah. I'll get the wrong information. Yeah, the, but rumor, I have the rumor mill. Right, yeah. but I have not formally shared any of this information. Okay, but when you all have meetings where you brainstorm different things, have they expressed, you know, wanting Mo to venture out into this type of? Well, I uh, I constantly hear about our pay scale. Um, oh, so, well, yeah, that I know. Yes, I so I, con I constantly hear about the pay scale, um, so that I know. We, it's been through senior staff discussions, so it has not been discussed about the week of 4th of July, um, so that has really not been shared. The 226 to, and 260 calendar changes, that's also been just through senior staff. So I would say that uh, there's nothing for me to hear yet, but I'm sure peop after today, I'll some people are watching, so they'll ask me questions. Sure. Um, are we going to get a breakdown of departments and, and assumptions for different departments or I know that we've usually done that a little bit later in the budget process. Okay, and, and, I just want to know because my question was going to be, are we considering technology at all as part of our, uh, the assumptions that we need to address for next year? Right now, uh, I have a preliminary um, department budget and campus allotments done. Um, I'm not able to fund any additional technology purchases. I'm funding all of the licenses, all of those kind of things. We have a little bit in there to do with breakage and some of that. Uh, but again, kind of like we talked about last month, it's really hard once you go to one-to-one -to, -one to be able to keep up with that in a general fund budget. Uh, and, and so it, it becomes a uh, how can we finance that? Mm -hmm. you know, do we do it through bonds? Do we do it through maintenance tax notes? Uh, and, and how do we fund that? I'm very satisfied though, Mr. Atkins, with the fact that um, you know that not necessarily devices is what we need, but that you know that we need whatever it is, if, if it's infrastructure or insurance, or, but that technology is a priority. Oh, yes, ma'am. I mean, I think we found that out this year the hard <laughs> way. And, and I think going forward, you know, it, we might take a step back in the state, but I think technology is going to be there uh, okay. more and more as we move forward. Okay, thanks. So, Bill, if you could now go to the next one. We do have um, our next one planned on April the 22nd. And, of course, at any time, if anything, we hear anything from the legislator, something changes that would help us or hurt us, we could always add another budget meeting to, to change things um, and go from there. That's all I have. Thank you. The 24th, is that public hearing? Is that what you mean? Yes, ma'am. That, okay. that um, is, would be the public hearing. The public hearing. Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah, we should be pretty wrapped up by then. By then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank Bill because I know he worked like at least four days during spring break on this. So thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Madam President, that's all we have. All right. Then if there are, is no other discussion, this meeting is adjourned at 5.48 p.m. And thank you, everyone.
Yes, ma'am. Thank you.